Hello friends and neighbors, this is Pastor Stephen Wall coming to you again from St. John St. Peter Lutheran Church in Cleveland, Wisconsin. We are continuing today our series of devotions going through the Augsburg Confession. The Augsburg Confession of 1530, the year 1530, when Emperor Charles V gathered together the German princes, the German electors, and uh, was trying to unite them so that they could be united as they defended the Holy Roman Empire against the Muslim Turks, who were the Ottoman Empire, who were advancing into Europe and approaching Vienna, and they would lay siege to Vienna. But those Lutheran princes, those Lutheran electors, stood up for their faith, and, and this, the Augsburg Confession, is what they declared their faith to be. And so for us to do, for us today, we still look at the Augsburg Confession as a statement of what we believe as Lutherans. And so it's worthwhile for us to look through, uh, to examine, to be reminded of these core truths. And as a, as a statement of what they believed, they also stated things that they rejected. And we're going to see that today as well. Uh, last time we looked at the first article of the Augsburg Confession. The first article is all about God. Uh, that's a pretty good starting spot. Uh, what does God tell us about himself? Who is God? Who is the Lord? And we talked about the Lord is, uh, he is triune. That's how he reveals himself to us, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Three persons, yet only one God. This week we are looking at Article 2 which is about original sin. And so I'm just going to read through Article 2. I invite you to follow along. I'll put the words up on the screen, but also look down in the comments and there is, or, or the information about the video, there is a link to a document. If you want to download the entire Augsburg Confession along with some, uh, a few notes in the margin to help you understand some of the historical context, uh, you can find that at the link down below. So Article 2, about original sin. Our churches also teach that since Adam's fall into sin, all men who are fathered in the normal physical way are conceived and born with sin. This means that they are born without the fear of God, without trust in God, and with evil desires. This disease, or original sin, truly is sin. It condemns and brings eternal death to those not born again through baptism and the Holy Spirit. Our churches condemn the followers of Pelagius and all others who deny that original sin is truly sin. Such people argue that humans can be justified before God by their own strength and reason. This lessens the glory of Christ's work and its benefits. You know, it's never easy to examine ourselves and recognize the sin that dwells within us. Our tendency normally is to try and diminish our own guilt right, to try and diminish, to try and justify ourselves, to argue away when we've done something wrong that we know uh, for which we are guilty, uh, we try to excuse it somehow. We try to explain it. I had a good reason for doing what I did. Uh, I got caught up in it. Or, or like, like, um, like Adam, after the fall into sin, tried to blame his wife, tried to blame Eve, Look, it's the woman here you put here, God. It's, she's the one who gave me the fruit to eat, and I ate it. We try to uh, pass the blame on to others or diminish our own guilt, and so to lessen our own guilt before God. But the truth is that each and every one of us has within us a, a sinful nature. We are corrupt to our core, sinful, like, a, like the Augsburg Confession explains, like a disease that we can't get rid of. And Psalm 51, verse 5, for example, as David, King David, 
was reflecting over his guilt, he confesses that it's not just the sins that he had committed that made him sinful, but rather that he was already sinful and guilty at birth, even before that, at conception. Psalm 51, verse 5. Surely I was sinful at birth, sinful from the time my mother conceived me. You know, when God formed Adam and Eve, he made them in his own image. That's what the Bible tell, tells us. He formed them in his own image. Now, what does that mean? Does that mean that they looked like God? Like uh, you, you think of parents when they have a newborn baby and they're, they're showing the newborn baby to their friends or to their, their family. And, and they, the, the friends look at that baby and say, oh, that baby has your smile or that baby has your, your eyes. That baby has your, your hair, your dark hair. You know, whatever it is, we see, we see uh, an image of the parents in that child. We see the characteristics, the traits, the facial features, perhaps, in that child. Is that what it means in Genesis chapter 1, chapter 2, where it says that God made man and uh, woman in his own image? No, what that is telling us is that Adam and Eve had the likeness of God in the sense that they were sinless, they were righteous, they were in harmony with God's will, with what was good. They didn't have to think about what was good or what was evil. They just did what was good because they were in harmony with God's will. The only command that they were given the only evil that they could possibly do was to break that one command, to eat that fruit that God forbade them to eat. But something fascinating happens. After that fall into sin, after they eat the fruit that they were forbidden to eat, we read it in Genesis chapter 5, where it talks about Adam's descendants. Genesis chapter 5, it says, This is the account about the development of Adam's family. In the day that God created man, he made him in the likeness of God. He created them male and female and blessed them. And on the day they were created, he named them mankind. Adam lived 130 years, and he became the father of a son, and this is important. He became the father of a son in his own likeness, according to his own image. So when Adam had children, those children were in the likeness, in the image of Adam. And again, we're not talking about having the facial features or other characteristics of Adam, but we're talking about this one thing that Adam had lost, which was the likeness, the image of God. That holiness, that, that perfection, that sinlessness was gone. Now corrupt by sin. The sinful nature had so corrupted Adam that it passed on to the next generation. From generation to generation, that sinful nature is passed down so that for you and for me as well, we are born with a sinful nature. A sinful nature that leads us into all kinds of sinful actions. No matter how we try to rationalize them, justify them, explain them away. The truth is we sin against God repeatedly, time and time again. Sometimes we sin not, not even in, with our actions, but with our thoughts, with our attitudes, the reasoning behind the things we do. Even if what we do is a good thing, yet our motives so often are corrupt as well. And all of this is, is to point us to our desperate need for a Savior. And that's what we have in Jesus. And that's what Article 3 is going to tell us about. The salvation that we have through Jesus Christ. How God rescues us from our sins through Jesus Christ. How God cures that disease. How God removes that corruption for, from us and takes away our sin. 
So pay attention next time as we dig into article number three. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. Amen. Before you, God, the judge of all, with grief and shame I humbly fall. I see my sins against you, Lord, my sins of thought and deed and word. They press me sore to you, I flee. O God, be merciful to me. O Lord, my God, to you I pray. O cast me not in wrath away. Let your good spirit ne'er depart. But let him draw to you my heart that truly penitent I be O God be merciful to me O Jesus let your precious blood be to my soul a cleansing flood Turn not, O Lord, your guest away, but grant that justified I may go to my house at peace to be. O God, be merciful to me.